I am an AV, but I'm terrified of microphones, so stick with me here. So as he said, my name's Keith Brown with Audio Video Innovations. So we're a full service AV company here in the Dallas area. So we work all over the Metroplex doing all the things you would expect, lights, sorry, you probably expect TVs, audio, but we do motorized shading, automated lighting, outdoor screens, all of those things. We're gonna talk about pretty much all of those things today. As we go through this, some of it may be pretty basic, some of it may be new to you. If I see a lot of nodding heads, I'll spend more time on those subjects, a lot of like disinterested looks, we'll move on. But I'd love as much interaction as I can get from you guys just to understand what it is that y'all are dealing with and what's useful to you. Before we start, who here is a production home builder? Okay, custom home builder? Other AV company just here to see what we're doing? Okay. Um, well, anyways, what we're talking about today is misconceptions about the smart home. So things that we believe that may or may not be true about smart homes and what they, what they are, what they are in our marketplace right now. So Wayne Gretzky, fairly well-known guy, said, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. One of the things that we find a lot in our marketplace is that we're basing our past experiences and using those to determine how we're moving forward. We find a lot of people have had bad experiences with AV, so they avoid it as much as they can. They've had bad experiences with technology in general. They avoid it as much as possible. Um, we need to be focused on where technology is going. That doesn't mean we're not going to learn from past mistakes. We're not going to do stupid things just because new technologies come out. But we want to focus on where technology is headed and how that's going to assist us when we build homes. So when we talk about defining the smart home, uh, to help with sales, Coldwell Banker actually came up with their definition so that they could define specifically what a smart home was so they could use it in their marketing. And what they said, you can read it on the screen, basically it's a home equipped with network connected products, connected via Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, there's some protocols for controlling, automating, optimizing functions, blah, 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 blah. Very, very boring, very, very dry definition. And also it only talks about products. We have a completely different definition of a smart home. We say a smart home is a home designed around the comfort and convenience of its residents in which technology systems, when designed and engineered correctly, uh, complement and improve life in the built environment by having enhanced functionality and con control. Essentially, we're talking about the way people live in the home, not the products they put in the home. Most good AV companies should be somewhat product agnostic they're not focused on a brand, they're focused on finding out what the client needs and actually just delivering that to them with whatever technology or lack of technology it takes to meet their needs. But a minimum consideration of what we consider a truly smart home is a home that is secure, so we're not creating liabilities for the client or for the builder. A home that's reliable, obviously if things don't work, they do become frustrations. Our biggest past complaints with people who Maybe a new client comes in, they've had experience with another system. They've said, oh, I had blank, I hated it, it never worked. Most common thing we hear from clients that in the negative is, I had it, it didn't work, or I had it, no one knew how to use it, so we just never really took advantage of it. Um, on that note, it needs to be intuitive as well. Anybody that walks into the home should be able to use it easier than the home they're currently living in. It should actually make the house easier to use. I know that's a crazy idea. Um, but we've experienced it, we know that it's possible, we know that we can deliver this on a consistent basis if the right technology is used and the right conversations are had. So the number one misconception we hear from builders about smart homes is, I don't build smart homes. I don't need to be having this conversation, I simply don't build smart homes. Does anybody in here have Wi-Fi in their house? Hands, I see some nods, yeah. Wi-Fi is literally the smartest technology that we sell. Right, We're delivering the internet, all the 4K content that's available on the internet to your house through the air. It doesn't get any smarter than that. If you have Wi-Fi in your home and it works, you understand what it can be. You understand what smart home technology can be, what can be delivered, the value that can be brought by that. Um, we have actually had clients say, I don't want Wi-Fi in my house because they're afraid of negative consequences of it. But honestly, we believe that every house being built now is a smart home. It may not be built as that. You may even have a client that says, I don't want a smart home. I want something simple to operate, easy for me to use, something that's comfortable, something that matches what I'm used to. Chances are they still probably want a smart home. They're gonna want a thermostat that they actually know how to program. Does anybody here know how to program the thermostat from the wall? Okay, I've got a few hands. I can't do it. 
I cannot program a schedule into a thermostat on the wall, but if I pull out my iPhone and I have a really simple to use app, I can program that. I can be walked through a user interface that shows me how to program a schedule into my thermostat easier than I can using the actual device, yet what do people say? Well, I don't need smart devices. I just want it to control my temperature. That is the experience we're trying to deliver, and it is doable. So where's our market? These numbers never mean anything to me. 433 million devices delivered in 2017 doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, but what is interesting is just the growth that we're seeing in that market. So if you already have clients that have smart home technologies in their houses that are asking about it, that have interest in it, that demand is only growing. And honestly, any of these, uh, any of these technologies, the smart speakers, cameras, doorbells, uh, the doorbell intercom, I mean, we're seeing that in every house we build, either the client has it or they want it, or they're going to add it after they move into their house. I mean, that's just becoming so common, yet we still have this refrain of, I don't really want a smart home. They just want the convenience of the things the smart home devices deliver. What I do think is interesting is just to see that where the market is changing. So what we have here, 2019, this is just showing the market share of these specific categories and what percentage they make up of the whole of smart home devices. As you can see, smart TVs, Apple TVs, Roku's, that's the majority of the market right now. But we're actually seeing that by 2023, that's gonna become much, much less as a percentage of the overall market. What's gonna become a lot bigger is the share of smart home monitoring, it's geared to devices, and then lighting control. Uh, the lighting control side of it's really exciting to me because from what we do, that is the most life-changing technology that we put into a home. If we make it, essentially when people, when you invite somebody over to your house, what's one of the first things you do? You know people are coming over, you're throwing a party, you turn on the lights. You make the house look beautiful. You make it look the way it would have in the brochure if the brochure had what sold you the house. We give people that every single day. When they come home from work, they're not walking into a dark home. They're not leaving lights on all day so that they're willing when they get there. They walk in and they just walk into beautiful lighting, into a very warm, comforting environment that is essentially what they paid for. That's the home that they imagined when they bought it. You know, they weren't buying the empty shell. They were imagining, they were buying the experiences they expected to have there. And lighting control delivers that. And as we see here, that's going to see theoretically 30% compounded annual growth going forward in the next few years. So again, if that's not something you're doing now, it's something that people are gonna be asking about or desiring and maybe not knowing that you can help deliver to them. So that may be an experience you're not getting to be a part of, but they are going down the road and paying for it as soon as you're gone. So the homes being built now will contain technology. Either your subs are gonna install it, the client's gonna install it right when they move in, or at some point in time they're planning to have it. Maybe not all of it, but some of it. Um, at a minimum, we think it's our responsibility as the people building that home to make sure that their house is at least receptive to that technology, that it's a good host for whatever it is they're going to want in the future. Number two, my clients don't want a smart home. We do hear this a lot. Some of the reasons we hear, my home should need an instruction manual. Uh, I don't want to have my phone to turn on the lights. I swear every time we talk about lighting control for the first time to a client that's never had it, that's what they say is, do I really have to go find my iPad to turn my lights on? No, I promise that's not what this is about. We'll explain that later. Um, we do have a lot of people blaming their wives for not being tech savvy. Um, the, I don't want Google, Russia, Amazon, Facebook spying on me. We can't help with that. That probably is happening. Um, and then I don't want someone here all the time fixing my system. That is, again, something we hear, especially from people that have owned older, complicated systems that were poorly installed. There was always somebody in their house dealing with it. Um, just to kind of take that fear away, the biggest advancement we've probably had in smart home technology in the last two or three years is just the ability to remotely support those products. So we now have um, proactive network monitoring. So if a network's down, our systems are trying to figure out why it is. We're alerted so we can find out if the client has an outage in their neighborhood or if something might actually be wrong with the network. So if they're at work, we'll know that their system went down. We can find out if it's an outage. And if not, we can schedule a time for one of our techs to be there before they've even known that there was an issue. Um, we can automatically reboot devices that fail often. So if you have an Apple TV and that Apple TV freezes, all our client knows is the TV doesn't work. That's not a lot of help for somebody on the phone trying to support them, but if our network, or if our, um, 
ability to just remotely go in and say, hey, look, they said they were trying to stream Netflix. I'm going to reboot the Apple TV and see if that fixes the problem. No truck roll, no cost, just a very, very simple solution. So that someone can have the technology that delivers a good experience, but then also have the experience of enjoying that technology um, delivered in a much easier way than it has been in the past. Um, a lot of these devices now have client-facing apps. So if somebody did have maybe their own devices in the house that are causing issues, we can have it rebooted where they just pull out their phone, they open a real simple to use app, and it might say something like, TV's not working. Is that me? Um, but just making it a lot easier for people to be supported. Um, and then there are 24 seven support services where if a client calls in, there's somebody sitting there in front of a computer every single time looking at their system. So whatever problem they have, we have somebody sitting there that can actually look at it, figure out what's going on, and either get good information to our technicians so they can get out there quickly with the right information and the right parts, or they can ideally just fix it right there on the phone. And we're seeing something like 60% success rate in one phone call, system is repaired, no one ever has to go out to the site, which is very, very convenient for clients. Um, the truth is technology should simplify our houses. Um, it should provide more control options, not less. When I said people ask the question of should I, or do I have to use my iPad to turn on the lights? No, you should be able to do that if you want to, though I don't know why you would. You should be able to walk over to the wall and flip a switch just like normal. You could use an iPad, a phone, a tablet. I guess a tablet is an iPad. You should be able to just do it on a schedule. That's in an ideal world, having a smart system doesn't mean you're messing with a different kind of light switch. It means you're just not messing with light switches anymore. You're avoiding that. They're just doing what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. I gotta stop doing that. In my house, it's sunset, probably 30 minutes before sunset. We have lamps all over the house that come on. The exterior lights come on. Um, the bedroom lamps come on. Then at 11 o'clock at night, all of those lights except our bedroom lamps just go off. Because if we're not already in bed, we should be. Um, in the morning, when it's time to get up, the lamps on the bedside come on, the shades open. Um, and then again at night, um, sorry, and then when we go to work, those lights go off. They're not used anymore, they're just off. When we arm our alarm system, that automatically turns off the lights, it turns off the TVs, changes the thermostats. That's giving somebody a really useful level of control that they didn't have before. Way more convenient than saying, hey, instead of going over to your garage door, just pull out your phone and hit the garage door button on this app and then go into your security system and then hit the arm button and then go into the shades and close the shades. Like again, that's not useful. We understand that. Um, that's not changing the way people live in their home, but when you can group all that stuff together, it really is valuable. So individual smart devices make common tasks more easier and more convenient. And I think a lot of our clients and builders question is, does that convenience outweigh the complexity that they bring? Where we start to see a real valuable experience is when all of that stuff is combined. Um, this quote's by me, smart technologies combined create great user experiences. So like I said, if you walk out your door and there's a button right by your garage that just says away, when you hint away, you go get in your car, your alarm is armed, your shades closed, your lights turn off, your thermostat goes to an away setting, um, the TVs, if they're left on, turn off, the music goes off. That's actually useful, way more useful, again, than six different apps to do those six different functions. Um, so the perfect morning, just a picture we like to paint for our clients and something that we really can deliver that any good AV company should be able to deliver with the current technology that's out there. Um, you know, you wake up, like I said in my house, the shades rise and let morning light in. We know the morning light's good for us. Circadian rhythms, this is kind of a big push in technology. Um, circadian rhythm lighting, we know that that light is healthy for us. So we get that morning light in, we have the lights come on, maybe music starts playing in the bathroom, your favorite Pandora station. Go outside, do yoga. This is obviously an idealistic world, probably not real for all of us. And then when you come inside to your kitchen, you've got your shades down, perfectly filtered light coming in, and you tell the system on your wall, you say, hey, Josh, make my coffee, or make my cappuccino. You can be specific now, and it makes your coffee. You get to enjoy it right there. That's the kind of experience we want to deliver to clients, not just a bunch of apps. Could do the same thing with a date night, a simple scene that's designed on your keypad. You push the button, and all of a sudden, it lowers the lights, starts playing Otis Redding. I had to pick something. And it doesn't make your dinner for you, but it at least sets the scene so that while you're making dinner, you're having an experience that you might not otherwise be able to easily have. Oh my gosh. Uh, misconception number three, AV starts at the rough end. 
our process for working with our clients looks a lot like this. We have initial meetings with the clients to get an idea of how they plan to use the house, what their expectations are, who's going to live in the home, uh, how long they're going to be there, what their desire for that home is. It is a bridge to their permanent home. Does the client get transferred all the time from work and doesn't know how long he's going to be here? Are they planning to die in that home? Uh, we'll set up our finalized budget and scope, kind of figure out exactly what we want to do, and then our guys will go back and actually engineer and design that system. Only then do we actually even touch the house. After all that's done, usually there'll be another month or so gap, and then we'll actually go in and rough that job in. Eventually we'll go on to installation and then client training, the finalization of the install, and basically making sure that system does exactly what the client wants. One of the most common situations we run into is we get called in about here. Uh, we call it, my drywall is coming on Thursday, so need you to get some wire in the walls. Uh, again, if that's what, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. If that's what you're doing, then you probably are having less success than you would like. You probably are having clients that are not that thrilled with the system they're getting. Um, but that can be fixed, simply starting early. Jobs that we start early, um, on bigger jobs, you know, AV companies are working with the architect, the designer, the HVAC guy really, really early on to make sure that this infrastructure going into the house is exactly what it needs to be. Um, Advanced planning means fewer delays, pretty obvious. Um, but then client-directed design decisions may impact framing. Um, there are now these really cool boxes you can put in the wall behind a TV so that all the wire gets dressed right in there or so that we can have actually articulating TV mounts where the TV fits completely flush to the wall. Well, those are 14 and a half inches wide. Anybody know what else is about 14 and a half inches wide? A stud bay. So if you're trying to center that on a wall, you actually need a stud base centered on the wall. If you talk about that before framing, how easy is it to get a stud base centered on a wall? Pretty easy. Dave? With all the Never mind. Like you do, you need all the wires. <laughs> yes, you still need the wires. I think Michael actually talked about that later. Misconception number four. I guess not misconception, maybe misunderstanding. We hear this all the time. The client's bringing their own AV company in, so we don't have anything to do with that. Well, they're still bringing the AV company in onto your job site, right? You're still in charge of that. So I guess the pros, it's not on your plate. It's somebody else's job to manage. Uh, less risk of blowback on you, maybe. I do hear that a lot from builders who are like, ah, I like letting them bring their own AV company because then if they throw off the schedule, it's not my fault. No, they still blame you. Uh, the cons, it is somebody that's going to impact your timeline. Who knows where they fall in that reporting structure? Who do they really feel like they're beholden to? Usually it's the client, not you. Um, it's hard to hold them accountable, and then they're on your job site. If they have any safety issues, those are on you as well. The homeowner can handle it once I've gone. This is not a joke. When I went to my very first NARI meeting, um, first day in the industry basically, I sat down with the very first remodeler I'd ever met, sat across the table from him, and I said, hey, I'm new here. I do AV. And he's like, great. And I said, if you don't mind me asking, just so I can learn, how do you handle AV in your job sites? And he goes, if the client brings it up in an email, I ignore it until I've got the sheetrock up, then it's their problem. I, I don't work with him. And, but that, that was my introduction to it. It was basically, you're a thorn in my side. I ignore you as much as possible. Um, there are a lot of things that can't be done, or can't be done well, or can't be done cost effectively if they're done late in the process. For example, architectural speakers. Some of our architectural speakers now look like this. So ideally, client can't see this, but this part goes up in between the joists and a really small aperture comes out flush with the sheetrock, and now you have like a completely flush grill that's the same size as the small aperture lighting they're using in a lot of custom homes, so we can have a four or three inch flush grill that matches the lighting. Believe it or not, these are really hard to install after the fact. It's messy, it's complicated, it's expensive. Um, but if a client did want something like that, if they want a really unique product and they want you to help deliver it, having conversations about things like this early on can help. And honestly, things like that are profitable and there's a really good chance you can share in that profit. Um, Wi-Fi outdoors. Most of the houses that are being built now, it's not that easy to get wire to the exterior of the home once it's all buttoned up. And believe it or not, clients do expect to be able to FaceTime with their grandkids when they're sitting by the pool. That has become a very normal thing. It's amazing to me that it's in 20, 2019, 
2019, and we still have clients tell us that, well, I use my computer in the office because that's the only place it really works well. Like, we've gotten beyond that. There are solutions to that, believe it or not. Um, they might just be as simple a matter as running wires. Tunable lighting, has anybody dealt with tunable lighting or know what that is? Thank you, Dave. Anybody else, anybody installed tunable lighting on a job? This is still really new, but tunable lighting is essentially the ability to adjust the light from, say, theoretically 25 or 2700 Kelvin up to 5000 plus Kelvin with the same fixture. So that could be something manual where you just have a button on the wall or a dial or something like that where you can tune that light to what the client wants. In a really, really cool world, it's what we call circadian rhythm lighting, where that light is actually tracking with the sun throughout the day automatically. So you put the fixtures in and then your clients get perfect sunlight. So in the morning, they're getting an energizing light from the fixtures in their home that helps wake them up. It helps their bodies stop producing melatonin and start producing cortisol to wake them up. During the day when they're home, they've got this bright 6500K light, which we generally think of as really ugly blue light, but that's what the sun looks like. So if we put 6500K light in a house and all the windows are open and a ton of natural light is getting in, it's just going to appear that the sun is lighting the house from the edges to the core. That's a really cool effect. Um, and then at night, that light again trails off until by the end of the day, you've got like a 2200 Kelvin light that's gonna help your body realize it's time for bed, start to produce melatonin, and start all these systems that keep us healthy. And we're now learning that um, that circadian rhythm cycle, that 24 hour clock being out of balance, um, is believed to be a carcinogen. So the NIH is calling that a known carcinogen. So literally night shift work, people that work in night shift and are sleeping during the day and awake at night have a higher risk of cancer than other people. That's crazy and the fact that we have a technology that may be able to help with that is really neat, but we're not even talking about it yet because it's different. Uh, motorized shades, Michael's gonna talk a lot more about that in a minute. And then lighting control. Lighting control can be installed after the fact. There are a ton of great products out there. But if you want to get this aesthetic where we're taking, instead of having seven switches, you know, in two gangs between a kitchen and a great room, we just wanted to go to one keypad. Well, that has to be done ahead of time so that we can plan it. But then you have a very simple, easy to use system that's unique and that is getting this ugly clutter out of one of the most used, most beautiful rooms in the home. Acoustic treatments can't really see it very well, but that whole wall is just an acoustic treatment built in. The houses that are being built today are not great acoustically. They tend to be glass, hard surfaces, really smooth coatings, a lot of metal. Um, and those rooms aren't great for acoustics. We have clients who basically say, I, I find myself talking really quiet in my own home all the time because the noise just echoes so badly and we have purchased acoustic solutions just to help those clients. We're not even using them in theaters as much as we are just in living areas. Uh, doorbells that work every time. Anybody here have a Ring or Nest doorbell? They're fantastic. And I don't love a lot of do-it-yourself products. Those things are fantastic. But what we found is, believe it or not, Wi-Fi doesn't do great outside of the home. It has trouble getting out there, which we'll talk about a little more. But if we can hardwire a doorbell, we're gonna get it where when someone hits that button, every single time the client gets that notification on their phone, um, not something we can promise when we're just expecting Wi-Fi to get out of the house. On that note, it's all wireless these days. That's what we hear from people all the time. I don't need to install any infrastructure. It's all wireless. There's a solution for that. Again, doorbells that work every time work a lot better when they're wired. So when we depend on wireless for devices that don't need to be used on wireless, we end up creating a lot of issues for ourselves. Wi-Fi has a limited number of channels, especially the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. It's a very limited number of channels and there's a lot of interference on them. In this picture, it's hard to see, but we're not just competing with other Wi-Fi networks. We're also competing with devices like cordless phones and microwaves. So we want to move everything off of that 2.4 gig spectrum into 5 gig. Well, that 5 gigahertz spectrum, I know this sounds technical, but it's very practical. That 5 gigahertz spectrum can't go very far. It doesn't penetrate walls very well. Um, and so we're giving clients a suboptimal experience. Um, this looks very technical, but I promise it's important. So if we look at the Wi-Fi strength that we're delivering around a house, 67 is very good. It could be used for streaming video. Anything below that, we're probably just limiting ourselves to email and web surfing. And if you'll notice, the difference between 67, which is very good, and 80 is only about 13 decibels. Let me go to this one first. 
Well, when Wi-Fi has to go through a single sheet of drywall, it can lose three to five decibels. So 13 is not very good. How many sheets of drywall are on your average wall? Two. So every wall you go through, so just going through theoretically two and a half to three walls can cut your signal from very good to not really usable. Well, how many of you have more than two or three walls in a house? I mean, most of you. So if we're depending on the internet service provider to come in, put a modem in the exact perfect place where the router can be attached to it and Wi-Fi can cover the whole house perfectly, <laughs> excuse me, cover the whole house perfectly, it's not gonna happen. Um, maybe if you're building a 2,200 square foot house, it'll work fine. I know in my old house, which was 2,800 square feet, we were only covering about half the house with the, with the modem or the router that was given to us by the service provider. And our current house, which is about 3,300, takes three wireless access points to cover it stem to stern. And that's a relatively small, very, very open house. Um, but the solutions that were provided to us by the internet service provider just don't work. Uh, so I actually did this in my own house. So I turned on only one access point. I stood immediately under it. So I just held my laptop, this MacBook, right under it. And I was getting 36 decibels. I went about 40 feet away. So I walked into my family room where I could still see it, measured it with a laser. I was 40 feet away exactly. I was already down to negative 66. That's at the bottom edge of very good. I walked about four feet to the side so that there were two walls in between me and that access point, and it dropped to 72. Well, now we're in the barely usable range. And then I backed up about 15 feet, or went just around the corner and outside, but I could still see the access point through my window and I was at negative 88, which is right on the verge of dropping. That's just not even gonna see the network at all. But all that happened within about 75 feet of the access point. And that's what we're delivering to clients if we're not planning on having some sort of solution to get Wi-Fi through an entire home. If y'all learn nothing in this whole presentation, just remember that. I, I think that is really important to providing a good experience for the homeowners. And this just shows how some of the devices communicate, but we'll skip that and let Michael get up here soon. Number seven, in my price point, no one expects a smart home. The way smart homes are delivered now has changed a lot. Obviously, there's do-it-yourself product. You can go to Lowe's and buy a lot of smart home devices. Some of them are actually really, really good. Like I said, a Ring, I think it's Ring Elite. Is Ring Elite the one that you can plug, plug in? A Ring Elite doorbell is a fantastic product. And if all you want is a doorbell, that's a phenomenal product. If all you want in your house is music, Sonos is a phenomenal product. And you can, Dave knows, you can buy it at Best Buy if you want. You can buy it from us too, but you could buy it at Best Buy if you wanted to. There are great do-it-yourself options. They don't necessarily scale very well, but they're good options for kind of an entry-level home. Beyond that, you have subscription models. These are really popular in the uh, security markets because they already understand billing on a recurring basis, but they're gonna deliver a lot of really nice features, especially in that home monitoring and security area. But there are a lot of very, very cool products you can now buy on a subscription basis. So if you have a client that doesn't want to spend a ton of money up front, but actually is okay with the idea of spending monthly, there's options out there for them. And then there's what we call the professional models, which is typically going to be more expensive, but the client is buying that product, they own it, and they're not going to be having to pay residually for services. Now, there may be things that they can buy to improve that experience, like the ability for remote monitoring. Um, but generally, that's going to be your higher-end custom market. And it is not just luxury buyers that are looking for smart home technologies. First-time buyers, which are now often millennials, their expectations for what electronics can do for them are phenomenally higher than they've been in the past. They've grown up with phones. This is their expectation is that their house is going to be as easy to use as their phone. Um, they maybe are less concerned with big TVs surround sound that's probably not as important to them. They're gonna be watching a lot of stuff on a tablet or on just their phone. Um, but their expectations for good Wi-Fi are through the roof. Uh, and then they expect to actually be able to uh, see the things that are important to them in real time. So security cameras, uh, a security system that's gonna allow them to monitor the status of their home. That visibility is very important to them. Uh, a move up buyer, they're gonna expect to see more luxury features and things that are really family focused. So we're seeing a lot of buyers building in that you know, half a million and a little above that range that now really want a media room. We put the theater in homes and then we said nobody wanted a theater so we took it out. Um, 
but now we have a lot of people that want that place for their family to actually be able to hit pause and go do something together. One of the things we hear from a lot of our clients with young kids is they're always on their phone, they're always on their tablet, where I never see their eyeballs because they're always looking at something else. Well, the idea of just selling your kids to watch TV probably isn't great, but if they're going into a media room to watch a movie with their family and everybody's actually together sitting on the same couch, like for a lot of people that is now family time. So they want something like that media room. Um, outdoor entertaining and living is obviously a lot more important nowadays and we can deliver essentially the same living room experience outdoors. And then finally you have your luxury buyers. Most of what we see in Dallas are somewhat practical luxury buyers. They have money, but they worked for it, but they're willing to pay for things that are important to them. Um, you also do see that kind of conspicuous consumption mentality of like, I want something better than what my neighbor has. Like, whatever it is, I'll pay what it, whatever it costs. I want something unique and I want something that, as somebody just said, I win. Like, they want to be able to just say, I won. I got this, you didn't. Um, and then we have what we call like a legacy buyer. This is somebody who has succeeded at a really, really high level and now everything they're doing is about their family. It's building a place to get their family back together, a place where their grandkids want to come. I just heard an interview with Jerry Jones, where, or with Jerry Jones' wife, where she said, we built the Bravo Eugenia, their giant luxury yacht, so that I could get all the grandkids together in one place. I don't know that I'd spend $250 million or whatever that was to get all the grandkids into one place, but we have clients that are doing that, and if you can identify what kind of client you're building for, you'll have an idea of what their expectations are. And now, Michael is going to finish this presentation for us. Thanks, Keith. I think it's and as Keith mentioned, Michael's going to go up, and we'll have a little Q&A time potentially at the end. we got about 20 more minutes here until that. And so just wanted to introduce you, Michael. He's going to put his mic on or get his mic. He's got about 25 years plus year, uh, in consumer electronics. He specializes in Lutron Homeworks, Lutron Shades, Control 4, and Custom Integration. He's authored mul multiple articles for various publications, He's got experience in just about everything, installation, program, design, sales, et cetera. He has, um, he's CAD, LAN, and Visio Fluent. Certifications include ISF, HAA, and PARA, or P-A-R-A, and he is security licensed. He also serves on the Dallas Builders Association Board of Directors and on the Education Committee. So thanks again, Michael. Thanks. Thank you, sir. I'm going to move this along. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, I'm going to move on to number eight here. Low voltage is not inspected. All right, so production builders, custom builders. Low voltage is not inspected, so who cares? Right? Um, I want to make sure everybody understands something very important here. There's three main utility services that everybody who moves into a home is prepared to pay for. They're prepared to pay for electric, water, maybe gas, depending upon where the house is built and the service providers in the community or area. So I would argue that there is a very important fourth utility that every person that buys a home expects, and that's internet, okay? So just, that the, just because the cabling that runs and supports, whether it's the Wi-Fi or the hardwiring of the internet in the home, if people had to choose which of the services they were gonna give up from this screen, if you had to give up one of these in order to get internet, my guess is you probably would give up one of these. We've asked a lot of our clients and they all agree. So you need to get it in your head now, if you don't already have it, that the infrastructure that supports internet in your homes, whether you're a production or custom builder, is very important to your client, okay? And the idea that you can just drop a service provider router in the front office uh, where you've run a Cat5 or had your electrician run it or your low voltage guy, and think that that's going to be enough to make your customer happy after they've closed on the home and you've moved on to the next house is not going to do it. Okay, you got to make sure that either electricians or low voltage service providers that you're working with, your contractors, are pre-wiring for access points in strategic locations on the floor plans in your house. Because if you don't do that, then they're not going to have Wi-Fi in their house that covers the entire property, whether it's inside or outside, like Keith mentioned, around the pool or to the arbor on the other side or wherever it is. So you need to keep that in mind in terms of when you're wiring the house. Uh, in addition to that, um, you got to make sure that the wiring that's going to the outside of the house 
is going to support what the service provider needs. You deal with different service providers depending upon where the developers are and what you're doing in those communities. Some people are going to have a choice between multiple service providers. Some are going to have a monopolized area, whether it's an ETJ or whatever it is, and you've got to make sure that the infrastructure that your people are putting in at the DMARC location supports whatever the service provider needs, whether it's coax, whether it's cat, whether it's fiber, et cetera. So you have to pay attention to that. If someone moves in to a house and they want X service provider because they used them at their other house and the wiring that your, your subcontractor put in the house doesn't allow them to have that same service provider, you're going to have a problem. Okay? So keep that in mind. Um, make sure that you have a structured wiring panel. This is common sense stuff. Make sure that wall plates are being terminated correctly to support that. Um, I don't want to hang on to that too much. The big thing here is that fourth service that we talked about in terms of internet. If you have a choice in a home, you can't just do Wi-Fi only. Even if we pre-wire for access points in strategic locations to give them bulletproof Wi-Fi, and I'm not going to name names, but there are some builders that have latched on to this um, that think that this is the way of the future. Uh, that works for devices that have to have Wi-Fi, which are these mobile things, right? Our phones, our tablets, our laptops. But if there's a device that has a jack in the back of it that will allow you to plug in an Ethernet connection, you better be using it because that's going to make sure that they get the best experience when they're watching HD videos or playing games or whatever that content is, and then making sure that you relieve traffic from the Wi-Fi for those devices that can only use Wi-Fi, okay? And that bottom line means you have to run wiring. You have to run cables. You can't just say it's going to be wireless and put five pieces of coax in the house. Okay? You actually still have to run wire to support wireless. Okay? I can't emphasize that enough. So some of you may know it, but I've got to make sure we're talking about it. Oh, the other thing is um, putting one access point in a 3,000 square foot house uh, pre-wired on a ceiling above the landing of the second floor where the security alarm is, where the, the uh, siren is, is not going to do it. Okay? It's not a one and done. Make sure you're working with a qualified low voltage contractor to look at your floor plans, whether your production, whether your custom, so that you make sure that the access points are put in locations that are going to give proper coverage. And the client will pay for the access points afterwards. You don't have to pay for that. Just make sure the wiring infrastructure is there to support them so they get the best experience possible and they tell other people and you sell more homes. Right? Questions? Good. Thank you. Next. Apps are the best way to control a smart home. Maybe, maybe not. Um, there are certainly a lot of apps that are available. You can use apps on your smartphones, you can use them on your tablets, you can use them on your, uh, your Mac, you can use them on your PC. Um, we're required to use apps on those devices, but that is not the only option for controlling things in your house. All right, the other control interfaces that are non-app related, I'm just going to run through these and, and get you guys out of here. Um, handheld remotes. Don't underestimate the value of a handheld remote. When I'm watching television, whether I'm in my family room, my bedroom, my media room, my phone rings or something happens and I want to pause the show, do you think a client that's moved into your home, your beautiful home that you built, wants to have a, open an app or, oh, oh, excuse me, unlock a device, smartphone, tablet, find the appropriate app, go to the appropriate page just to hit a pause button when all they have to do is hit pause on a handheld remote? Do not underestimate the value of a handheld remote. All right? There's still a big place in society for that right now, especially in a home. Touch screens. We're used to those, right? Whether it's the ones we hold in, in our lap or, or, or uh, in front of us. But don't, don't, uh, don't, don't underestimate one that can go in a wall as well. A central location, strategic locations. Pre-wire for something that can support that. Whether it's in a master bedroom on the upstairs. Lots of living spaces on second floors now and nothing downstairs. Maybe a master, maybe everything's up. Don't forget about putting something in the kitchen area where you congregate and hang out a lot. Um, it may interface with the thing at the front door. Okay? Uh, people still like the idea of an intercom. So when someone presses the front door and I'm upstairs in the master bedroom, I can say, hang on, I'll be right there. Okay? If the wiring's not there to support it, it's not going to happen. It's not going to be as good of an experience. Um, voice control. This is the new latest and greatest, right? We all know this, Keith and, and other companies like us. Um, people want to integrate voice control. What's easier than saying something with your voice? Okay? Those can be set on top of the things that are already in the house for operating the control, whether it's HVAC, lighting, shades, etc. Um, and that can certainly be integrated now and it's becoming more and more popular. A good example would be, okay, 
uh, manufacturers like these, and, and there are others, but Lutron, Sonos, and Amazon, right? They have worked together to make sure that their devices have bulletproof voice control. So if I had Lutron lighting and shades in a house, and I had Sonos speakers or equipment in a closet, some central location, um, and I had an Echo Dot on my kitchen counter, I could say, Alexa, good morning, right? And the lights do whatever they do, and the shades do whatever they do, and the music starts playing. And those companies have worked together to make sure it's bulletproof. There are third-party companies that we sell products for that can sit above these and make it really simple and expand the ability of the control. But there's simple bulletproof things, whether it's production or custom, that can be added at the time of the build, um, put in your models, or after the people move in, assuming the wiring again is there to support it that makes it a very, very cool experience by just using their voice. A um, Couple other things, and then I'm gonna go through this pretty quick. So, window shading is not a hard cost, and therefore, it's not in my budget, right? Lots of people buy the home and then find out, oh my God, it's gonna be $10,000 to cover these windows, are you kidding me? Right, so I'm not expecting the builders to take on the cost of covering the windows, but I just wanna cover a few important things. Right? If you're going to have a client that potentially wants shades, lots of designs for houses now are transitional, they're a little more modern in their look and feel, right? so you don't have moving windows all over the place like we've had in the past. Maybe you have some casement windows that move, maybe you have a lot of solid plate glass. Think about what you're going to do to cover those or allow your clients to cover those once they close on the house and move in. Okay, So things to consider, right? there's mounting locations. So if you're gonna have shades as an opportunity, whether it's uh, automated or fixed, um, there's gonna be uh, the mounting location itself. Is it inside, is it outside? Is it gonna be a pocket above? And I'll, I'll dive into that a little bit. In addition to that is how is it gonna be powered? If you're a custom builder and you're doing a home that's gonna have motorized shades, you have two choices when it comes to power for your homeowner, whether it's a spec or sold home. You're gonna pre-wire low voltage wiring to power the shade or you're going to tell them it's going to be 8D batteries per shade. They're going to last about two years, and after you've covered 30 windows in the house, they get to change 250 batteries every time. Right? That's not realistic. Okay? So again, you have to run wires to power the shade. That has nothing to do with the control. Maybe that wire includes control. Maybe it doesn't. Okay? There is wireless control options as well, but at a minimum, you have to run a two-conductor for power. Talk to your low-voltage subcontract. Right? The control can be handheld and all the other options we discussed before. So I'm not going to dive into that. Mounting location, we talked about it before. Pocket mounts, if you want the ultimate, it's going to be up in the ceiling and you might have a flap and hanger or something that gives a very small reveal and allows the shade to come out of the ceiling, cover the window. Um, the other one's inside mount. It's going to go inside the framing of the casement of the window. The other option is going to be an outside mount. It's not deep enough. Your drywall guys gave you two and a half inches depth on one window, gave you four inches of depth on another, you know, your framers and drywall and all that together. So you have to think about that in terms of how it's going to be mounted. Because I'm going to do an inside mount and it's in a bedroom and there's five windows and two of them have the depth to accommodate the inside mount and the other three don't. That's weird. That's not going to work. You're going to have an upset client. All right? So the framing side of it comes into play as well. Um, power we talked about. It's either going to be batteries, it's going to be wired. If it's wired, then it's probably going to go back to some kind of power supply, and most power supplies will accommodate up to 10 shades at a time. Okay? You don't daisy chain power to shades. It all has to be home run, which means it's an added cost. Look, we know as low voltage contractors in the Smart Home Society and the rest, we are the least expensive sub on your home, whether you're production or custom builder. When we hand you an invoice for the pre-wire, I would argue we're the least expensive invoice that you're going to get of all your subcontractors. There may be some others, but I would argue that. Keep that in mind. Wire the house. Um, control, wall-mounted, handheld. This is cool too, right? Lots of these now. Sensors. Occupancy sensor. I can walk in and have something happen. I can walk into a space and shades do this, lights do that, music does this, just based on a sensor. That could be a motion sensor. It could be daylight sensor. All of those, right? But you've got to have a wire to the sensor. I mean, again, we're not going to replace batteries in umpteen of these when we had the chance to address it at the beginning. So, low voltage contractors do not impact my energy rating. This is one of my last things, and I just want to make sure I drill into this for a second, because this impacts you builders in particular. 
All right, this isn't about selling product. It's about making sure that you're dealing with people who understand your needs when it comes to energy. Energy efficiency is a big thing in homes, and that's related to the smart side of the discussion. So, I got a few bullets here. Low voltage contractors need to run the appropriate types of cabling to support a smart home option for your client. That's what we discussed before. Um, this will have a direct impact on the homeowner's experience. Keith and I both talked about this. Big thing here, do you check the wiring of your low voltage contractor? The inspector for your framing doesn't. The inspector of the plumbing doesn't. The inspector for electrical doesn't. Security wiring, low voltage wiring that's put in your house that supports all these smart home options is not inspected. Are you inspecting it? Are you making sure that the person you're working with is doing what they're supposed to to support your client? Make sure you are, right? Make sure somebody in your company does if you're not. Okay, IECC 2015, it was adopted by Texas officially September uh, 1st, 2016. There's a blower door test that's required for every home so that you can meet the ACH3, right? Air changes per hour of three. Electricians make a lot of holes in your home, don't they? They drill a lot of homes to run, or holes to run wiring there. Well, we do too, even though we're not inspected. So make sure you're aware of that, okay? Make sure that somebody's checking it. Your contractors need to be aware of this so that they're educated, so they don't cause you more headaches when you're going to get your blower door tests and other energy-related items addressed. Um, the truth is, low voltage contractors can be a major in, uh, factor in missing your air changes per hour requirement on your blower door test. And there's several reasons for this. Uh, they might be running uh, routing wiring, uh, uh, sorry, inefficient wire routing requiring more holes in the frames than needed because they messed up and they have to go back and run new cabling. They didn't get the length right, whatever the reason is. Electricians are guilty of this too. Improper cable runs around window flashing for security wiring. This is a big one, right? If wires aren't run into a window casing correctly, you're going to damage the window, or they're going to come in the wrong location, and they're going to cause a leak, okay? And you're on the hook for 10 years, statute of repose. You've got to make sure that you've got that stuff done right, okay? And make sure your contractors know what they're doing. Um, improper flashing techniques for penetrations in the building envelope, in particular for that location of demarcation on the exterior of the house. That's where the service provider is going to hang their thing, right? Next to the electrical meter. If that's not done right, if they don't flash the exterior, regardless of what the cladding material you're using is, you're opening yourself up to risk. So make sure that your contractors know how to properly flash any penetrations that they make. This includes firewalls. I do multifamily. My company does multifamily and single family. If we don't flash properly, we're going to have a problem. I don't know how many job sites I go to from other contractors on multifamily where they punch through the firewall to get cabling into the next unit. Nobody's addressing that and you find out after the fact. So make sure your people know what they're doing. Pay attention. Um, I think that's all I've got. Hopefully I didn't go too fast. Uh, Keith and I will open it up to questions and answers. Thank you all very much for coming. Appreciate your time and attention.